Welcome, Red Eyes members. Thank you very much for tuning in. Great to have you with us. We are continuing our excellent conversation with Hugh Newman about Earth energies, megaliths, and uh, much more. And uh, in this segment, uh, we sh- we're going to begin to talk a little bit more about seeds and some of the uh, fertility technology, if you will, and how this is kind of related to what we talked about in the first uh, segment. Uh, seeds, of course, is related to farming, and this connects a little bit with the, the program with we did uh, a while ago with Edmund Marriage. Uh, Hugh, if you will, tell us a little bit about how kind of... Uh, how you came on to this idea, or how you how you connected this idea with farming, with with megalithic sites and energies and things like that. Okay, well, um, one of the things I've been interested in for a very long time, which I've studied as well, is nutrition, um, especially naturopathic nutrition. And um, obviously, there's lots of different kind of more um, harmonic and holistic farming methods that you know, have been around for a while now. Um, but one of the things that I, I never really took me a long time to sort of grasp that there was a connection between nutrition and megaliths. Um, these are like my sort of two big subjects. I mean, I've got this sort of uh, amazing fascination with. I don't even know where this really comes from, but there's something within me. And they've never really come together until um, I was introduced to some research that John Burke had done in um, in America. He's part of the BLT research team. and. Yeah. Uh, there's a, there's a bookshop nearby called Labyrinth Books, which um, there's this book there that kept catching my eye called Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty by John Burke and Cad Halberg. And it was like it was like 25 quid or something. And I just thought, oh, I'm busy doing the earth grid stuff. I've done, I'm doing this other stuff. I shouldn't get it. And eventually, the lady in the shop, Susie, gave it to me one day. Mm-hmm. And, that, and, and I thought, okay, well, I'm obviously meant to have this. <laughs> so and eventually I read it, and it completely, just within the first few pages, it completely clicked something in me to do with the way that the ancients were working with earth energies it gave a huge pragmatic purpose and even a sort of shamanic purpose for the nature of earth energies which i've been researching for years you know i've been sort of since i read the sun and the serpent and sort of uh, all, that, all that kind of that kind of type of research and so that really you know opened up a whole new path for me which um, i'm developing into a book as we speak but that's going to be another year or probably 18 months before it even it's published because it's quite in-depth research that needs to be done. Right. Um, but I've got to thank John Burke for this because he's the one that really triggered my interest. But soon after, I found lots of other people have been doing similar stuff, and um, but no one was really sort of suggesting it was a global phenomenon that, that there was an understanding of earth energies and how it could enhance fertility and seeds uh, all around the world. Um, and even the symbolism I found kept linking up with this as well. Mm-hmm. This is it sort of started drifting into the grid research because. There seemed to be this global knowledge base that sort of came from somewhere and was shared around the world almost simultaneously. And some cultures kept this and others lost it. So um, but it seems the older cultures, there seems to be more evidence of it there. And what it is basically, you know, I'm sort of rambling a bit here perhaps, but what it really is, is uh, how Earth energy, specifically telluric energies, which are produced from the magnetic field, how they interact with um, the Earth itself, the geology. And sacred sites seem to mark where strange sort of energies, where the energy shifts, where it becomes less magnetic and, and uh, bursts into this electromagnetic charge, which is <clears throat> when seeds are placed upon this electric charge, which is often strongest in the morning when the sun's rising, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the way the sun influences a magnetic field and breaks up all the field into lots of field lines, all these telluric earth energies. And it becomes, um, what, it, what it is, people put the seeds in the dolmen or the chamber or, or the certain part of the stone circle or on the top of the mound or even on pyramids they found in, in, Me- in Mexico and Guatemala it works on as well uh, and in Peru, funnily enough, um, that when the seeds are placed there and there's this electric charge taking place at this particular time of day, you put them on there for about an hour um, or even 75 minutes perhaps and then when you go and plant them and, and, and then plant some control seeds that haven't been in, in, in the sacred site there's massive differences in the final yield, uh, how fast they grow, and the, and the quality of the crops. Um, and this, you know, this has been noted at sites all around the world. This same phenomenon happens. As though the ancient, it's like an ancient, very advanced source and very simple technology of seed enhancement, and getting more, growing double, sometimes double or triple the amount of food than if they hadn't been placed at these sites. So it looks like they were doing this for, with, a, with a great purpose. Right, right. And um, so we're looking at fertility, basically, fundamentally. Oh, that's fascinating. And, you know, this reminds me of, there's two areas here we can go into. And one is, of course, I've heard these stories about uh, placing different uh, 
kinds of foods inside uh, pyramid structures in order to make it last longer and things like that. Uh, there could be a connection there. And the other branch to this, of course, is that this also seems to connect with some of the research that I think the BLT team has done on, on yeah. crop circles in regards to uh, the yields of, of uh, the the, um, the crops that were a part of the circle. Isn't that right? Mm. Yes. In the, uh, this research actually came from crop circle research. I mean, John Burke is uh, part of the BLT research team. And what they found was uh, one of the uh, quick, easiest ways to find out if there was a difference in energy is uh, where a crop circle is formed. If you go back there the next year, it's exactly the same spot. What they noticed, among, amongst other tests they did as well, but this is the sort of key one that kind of really made me think of the long-term effects of a, a, a sort of temporary sacred site like a crop circle can have. A year later, the crop where the crop circle had been was now growing better and faster and with more yield. Um, and so that alone thought, well, actually, there's something, the, en the energy of crop circle construction or the geometry or both, um, you know, somehow enhances um, the crop in that space that it formed it, although even a, a season later. Mm. So that's, that's kind of where some of these ideas came from. Some of the readings they were taken as well, when you get the bent nodes of crop, you know, the crops, that's one way of sort of deciphering if it's a, a possible true formation or hoax is the bent nodes. They've almost like been microwaved. And then we have the work of Elcio Hasselhoff, a Dutch um, um, researcher who got this published in Physiologia Plantarum as well, this sort of science journal. The idea that he proved from testing all the different um, type, different energies or, or burns even, sort of microwave energies of the crop, um, and he could work out where the energy had come from. It had come from some moving object about four feet above the crop. As though, and we've seen these images of these balls of light moving and creating crop circles. Mm. It was the Oliver's Castle, for example, in 1996. And there's been lots of eyewitness reports as well. Mm. Uh, people don't know what these balls of light are, but somehow they seem to be an intelligent force moving around, sort of uh, beaming down an energy source, which which he recorded uh, in the within the crops and using certain you know devices, and came up with that conclusion. So and, and it affected uh, the quality of it as well. And so there's a lot. So again, there's lots of different areas, you know, quite scientific stuff, which is now supporting um, this idea that not only do balls of light create crop circles, but there seems to be a connection uh, with the ancient sites. And it's sort of like showing us a part of, you know, so like the crop circles kind of showing us geometry, but also um, a deeper connection with the past as well and how things worked back then. Yeah. Do, do you know if there's uh, evidence that suggests that uh, around then some of these megalithic sites there were farming taking place or did, do you think that it was just that they potentially uh, put the seeds in within the, this area for a short period of time uh, in order to to uh, to boost the seeds if you will well the, the, yeah there's, the, there's two sides to this there's the um, you know whether it's just seeds being placed within a space makes all the difference or if there's a landscape fertility sort of thing going on as well well, there seems to be both. Um, not necessarily at all the sites, though. It's like sometimes one of each, depending. Um, but there's been lots of research done in Australia about this, um, about how uh, Alana Moore has done a remarkable book called Stone Age Farming, uh, which has got a picture of like an Irish round town on it. Um, and it shows how they did test not only using the actual rock dust, which is helps um, remineralize the soil, which is the same kind of rock you use, basalt or whatever, for stone circles. Mm -hmm, yeah. But the, when certain pockets of basalt stone and different types of rock were placed in, like sometimes in tiny little stone circles that are two feet across, with six stones in or something, uh, placed around a farm, it reorganized all the telluric energies um, and create a very harmonic field of um, high, quite energized uh, soil and crop. Mm. And combined, you know, if you're sprinkling rock dust on there as well, because it's positively magnetic, uh, this type of rock, then it attracts the telluric energy and works with them. And you just, and then you just sort of um, place it in. So there is a fertility, there is a landscape fertility thing going on as well. And perhaps on a much grander scale, the ancients understood this, and they built these, these major kind of sites, you know, the big stone circles, etc., and pyramids even, and then smaller stones placed around, you know, in between them. Uh, which would make sure the energy kept flowing. They kind of the telluric energy were attracted to these types of stones. They knew that the ancients, and then built, you know, like a whole system around different countries, and even into a potential grid around the planet. Uh, you know, if we're looking at it quite an extreme scale here, 
But um, and we also know telluric energy from everywhere. I mean, they move through water. They, you know, they have different qualities. So there could have been some understanding of that. So we've got landscape, possibly global connections here. And and obviously these sites are very similar all around the world. Yeah. The dolmens we've already talked about. Um, we know that dolmens are everywhere. The pyramids as well. There's a remarkable distribution of pyramids and um, and also stone circles and just just standing stones which um, act like you know, acupuncture needles in the earth. Yes. But, you know, one thing that comes to mind is why they would, you know, what the reason would be for to, to do this. Do you think it could be just for the sake of increasing uh, uh, the crop yield or could it be that, that something uh, had happened and, and th- that meant that they had to get a lot of food quickly or fast and they had to, or the circumstances was, was different back then, meaning that, 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 they, that they had to have stronger uh, uh, seeds they could take, like uh, if there were climate change going on or uh, theories like that, anything? Very good question, actually. Um, yes, I mean, I mean both, really. I mean, as far as I mean, it's finding out that you know that there's technology there to start with is really the first step for me. I, you know, before I kind of try and work out, you know, why, uh, because I want to just work out if it still functions as a kind of en- energetic system, as a surviving technology, which still works. Um, and so that is the first step for me. But yes, I mean, there's theories about why it could have happened as well. Um, the purpose of it. I mean, such major engineering projects would take hundreds of people, possibly thousands of people, and possibly many years, even generations, yeah. to build some of these sites. So there must have been a pragmatic um, purpose for it, in my opinion. Uh, I just feel that, you know, it's, it's something to do with survival. Um, where, whether it, there was a climate change, whether there was even a movement of the Earth's crust or an asteroid, but there's, you know, there's stories of all these ancient catastrophes that happened. Exactly. That yeah. Could easily have been a contender um, for the purposes that they had to find stability, that to make sure things were possibly flooded or destroyed, or we don't know. It's, it's really because we don't know the different aspects of our of our sort of history, even as close as ten thousand years. It's hard to kind of piece it together sort of accurately and sure. speculate on, the, on these matters. Sure, but it, could, what, what, what it might suggest is that before the periods of, of the megaliths, uh, things might have been uh, much more, you know, pleasant, if you will, on Earth. But but if, if there were a potential catastrophe, this would have uh, uh, sparked their, uh, you know, their need to do something like this, if this indeed was, you know, the only purpose of, of these megalithic sites to, to boost uh, the, the yield of their crops and to, to basically, th- this was for survival, we could say that, potentially. Yeah, you could say that, but it, it could have also been because they... Um Became, they were starting to become farmers rather than, you know, exploring and, and hunting or whatever. We, we, right. we still, again, there's a grey area over what people were really up to back then. Yeah. But um, and that, as they were settling into sort of small societies, their populations may increase, and especially if they've got these sites which are making them all fertile as well, they'd probably be growing kind of families quite quickly, um, lots of kids around and all that kind of stuff. Right, and, uh, right. And this could have happened. This could have been, you know, it could have been something wrong with humans. You know, it could have been a, a fertility problem. And so the, you know, the um, astronomer kind of Earth energy kind of people, you know, kind of ge- geomancers built these sites. Somehow they knew the technology. It was learned from somewhere, or it was trial and error. Again, I kind of do when you start looking at the ancient legends. Again, you, you do start thinking about Viracocha and. And these sort of, um, and even this, you know, some of the myths of Kalanish um, up in the, the Outer Hebrides, the massive stone sort of circular structure there. Um, it talks of these sort of feathered, kind of very tall white people who came and built the place and revered it and worked with it. And, and there's a whole aspect of astronomy in here as well. Yeah. Is, um, if there was some kind of cataclysm, which you suggest, um, perhaps they, you know, if things had moved, if the crust had moved slightly for some reason then they'd have to recalibrate um, all their calendars if they're going to have 